Hello, this is the Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in human consciousness. In this episode, I had the honor of speaking with philosopher Tom Clark. Tom hosts naturalism.org, one of the web's most comprehensive resources on worldview naturalism, its implications and applications. He is also a research associate at the Institute for Behavioral Health at Brandeis University, working on solutions to drug addiction and other behavioral disorders. We had a great conversation about the subjective versus objective experience of consciousness, neural correlates of consciousness, death, and more. Please enjoy this episode with philosopher Tom Clark. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm, I'm really excited to, to talk to you. Read read over a couple of your papers, and you've got some, some fascinating ideas. So I don't know if it's fair to do so, but maybe we could start with some general thoughts on on consciousness, um, is it even possible to define it or describe it, or you know, what is your general understanding of what you think consciousness is? Yeah, well, I come from a naturalistic standpoint, and that that's sort of the big picture. Uh, I host a website called naturalism.org. I started something called the Center for Naturalism, which is a a, a, a science-based worldview that says that uh, in deciding what's real, we really have to stick with intersubjective scientific evidence, science is sort of the paradigm of what's intersubjectively ascertainable, right? So <clears throat> when it comes to consciousness, consciousness is, presents a real issue for naturalists like myself, um, naturalists as opposed to supernaturalists. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, it's a tough problem because uh, consciousness, uh, subjective experience isn't um, isn't an observable. It's not out there in the world the way physical objects are. So to naturalize something is usually thought to be, well, show it to be part of the physical world. And that has worked in just about every instance that we know of. Life uh, uh, is not, has been naturalized in this sense. It's a, understood as a physical process. But consciousness, uh, because of its subjective nature and, and its qualitative nature, has, has posed a real problem for uh, uh, for naturalization in this sense of being scientifically tractable. So from my perspective as a naturalist, uh, someone who believes that the natural world is all there is, uh, then the, the, the issue of consciousness becomes um, a, a very interesting, fascinating problem actually. It's obsessed me for years. So uh, in defining consciousness, I think that's what you asked, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, it is, or at least a notion of, of what you think. Sure, is. sure. I think it's really important, and I'm, so I'm glad you asked the question uh, from a philosophical standpoint. It's really important to define our, our terms clearly. Uh, what, we're, what I'm talking about when I talk about consciousness is conscious experience. Uh, conscious, uh, when we're awake and uh, out and about uh, doing the things that we do in the world while we're conscious, we have a stream of experience. This uh, experience, experiential stream is constant throughout our, our waking lives, uh, and, and we, have, of course, have dreams. But what's uh, definitive about experience in the way I'm, I'm talking about it that needs to be explained uh, when we're tackling the problem of consciousness is the qualitative sensory experience, for instance, of having a pain or seeing red, red being the typical, the sort of most talked about uh, Ex experiential quality that philosophers deal with. Right. So sensory experience like red, seeing red, um, experiencing pain, tasting a mango, the, these qualitative experiences are the, for me, the central target of trying to explain consciousness. So we have, uh, you know, self-consciousness, um, which is a, a particular sort of uh, type of experience. But when uh, in our discussion uh, that we're going to have here, the, the target, the explanatory target is what I would call sensory consciousness, which has qualitative, a qualitative feel to it, the quality of, of seeing red, of feeling pain. And it's also, um, I'd say, categorically subjective, that, it, that is private. You're not going to see experience out there in the world. You're going to see physical objects, but you're not going to see my conscious experience of an apple, for instance. The apple is out there. You can experience an apple, but you're not going to experience my experience. If you see what I mean, so that's that's yeah. sort of the what what I'm I'm talking about when talking about what are we trying to explain here? How how does this sensory experience arise uh, as a function of well we're we're trying to find out why it arises. 
that's the that's the hard yeah. problem. It is. What what about it makes me think about awareness. Is awareness just part of everything you just described, or because I've often, well, not often, but I occasionally hear people just define consciousness as awareness of your awareness. And so yeah, that's is kind of a, a, the awareness a, a, a of the pain or the the qualia. Is that part of it? Well, it, you you sort of described a, a reflexive notion, uh, awareness of awareness, sort of a, right. a meta representational um, take on it. My my take would be more. Uh, direct, um, a, a single level, where experience doesn't necessarily require you to be aware of having experience. It's simply the presence of a quality in your conscious, mm. in, in conscious experience. But the, not to say that we aren't often, especially in conversations like this, uh, aware of being aware, but awareness itself is simply being responsive to the world and in a conscious sense, having qualitative phenomenal experience. So you can you can talk about primitive sorts of awareness or responsiveness that don't involve experience, but what we're talking about is awareness and responsiveness that involves ex- a phenomenal experience. And by phenomenal, I, I simply mean having experiences with qualities, like as as I described it earlier. Right, right. It's uh, and you mentioned this privacy notion. I mean, you have that that funny. I, I like the analogy about the fish, as you don't know what something it is like to be a hooked fish. Um, and I liked it because I ended up not, I used to be a big fisherman and then I realized this, this animal is panicking and maybe feeling pain on the end of my line. And I couldn't, I couldn't fish anymore. So I think even before I got into consciousness, I started thinking to myself, wow, there is something it's like to be this hooked fish. And, and it bothered me, but your, yeah. your analogy and the point is really that we can't, we can't observe this fish's pain, this quality of, mm-hmm something it's like to be a hooked fish. Right. Uh, yeah. As I said before, consciousness, conscious experience really has two primary characteristics. And one of them is its subjectivity or privacy. You're not ever going to see an experience, for instance, the possible experience of a fish in pain. You're not going to see that pain as a public object. That's why we have the problem of consciousness in the first place. If experiences were public objects, then there would be no question about whether fish feel pain, right? <laughs> we would see the pain as, a, as something as, as objective as the fish itself, but we don't. And it's the same that goes for us. We don't see each other's conscious experiences, even though they're real. My experience of pain is as real as anything I can put my finger on. It's as real as any physical object that I can see or touch, but it's not available to you. It's not a public object in the way that my brain is, for instance. So the fish example, which I had in this paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, it's uh, maybe you'll, you'll link to it uh, in this episode, called Locating Consciousness, Why Experience Can't Be Objectified. And I start off with this example of how would you know, uh, how can we tell whether fish feel pain or not? And it's actually, dis- you know, this is debated in the journals. <laughs> it's not an academic question, as you just said. You're, you stop fishing because, well, maybe this fish is experiencing something, and it's not good. So, uh, yeah, that's the privacy or subjective, the subjectivity of conscious experience is, is one of the things we have to explain to naturalize it. How can we explain the fact that a physical objective creature like you and me has episodes that are perfectly real to it, but not observable from the outside. So what is happening? Is there something physical, scientifically observable that's happening? It's kind of like, I think I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but you mentioned the neural and functional correlates of consciousness. So is there, is there, do you think there is such a thing? And is oh, that yeah. observable? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, as, as a good empiricist, naturalist empiricist, we have to look at, at the evidence uh, around how consciousness arises in humans and other creatures, presumably. And what we see, as you just mentioned, are the neural correlates of consciousness in the brain. And those are organized into probably functional correlates. In other words, the neural processes that are distributed, distributed in our brains are do various things, have, have various functions. And it turns out that only certain parts of the brain or only certain functions are strongly correlated with conscious experience. 
And this gives us a strong clue as to why consciousness might come to exist in the, in the first place. So this research that's, that's ongoing, there's you know, a lot of time and money and research programs being devoted to discovering the neural correlates of consciousness, the NCC, uh, that I, I think is playing and should play a major role in how we develop our understanding of conscious experience. If you, if you don't look at that evidence, if you don't look at the neural and functional correlates of consciousness as they exist in human beings and, and in, say, primates, higher, um, higher mammals, as, um, not to put down the lower ones, uh, if, if, you, if you don't pay attention to that, then you're missing the boat, I think, in terms of our understanding of, of why it should be that we're conscious. Well, it turns out we're only conscious when certain neural activity is going on. And so the question then is, well, what, what functions are those, uh, is that neural processing serving? That's got to be, in my book, a central part of the, uh, of the answer to the question why, of why we're conscious. What central role is it playing? Do you, do you mean not only in our, our lives, but do you, is that, does that imply evolution? Yeah, um, clearly, and this is a, an, an interesting point, uh, the, the processes that are associated with our being conscious are central to our cognitive capacities, right? In other words, mm -hmm. we can't deliberate, choose, uh, move about, um, function in the way we normally do without consciousness being present. So it, that suggests, strongly suggests to me, that the processes associated with consciousness are, cent are central functions of being a complex creature like ourselves. And from an evolutionary standpoint, we can see that those cognitive capacities were so naturally selected for, right? Uh, and we are now very, very smart creatures with um, capacities to represent the world in our bodies and, and run simulations in our heads. Those capacities are the ones uh, that are strongly associated with being conscious. So uh, it would seem, uh, you might draw the conclusion then, well, consciousness itself um, must play a strong central functional role in uh, controlling the, our behavior. That's the, us the usual assumption. And this gets into an interesting question of uh, what the function of consciousness is. There's no question that the capacities, the cognitive capacities associated with the consciousness serve primary functions. And of course, uh, it's the way I look at it, it you don't have to be a, a self-conscious creature like human beings are to be conscious. So consciousness probably arose uh, way back when in uh, uh, phylogenetic development, uh, well before human beings arrived on the scene. But Consciousness per se, that is phenomenal experience, although it's associated with this, these capacities that play a, a critical functional role in behavior, experience itself, it's difficult to show that it has a function over and above the neural, neurally instantiated processes and functions that it's associated with. So I, I don't know if this is uh, clear, but a lot of people insist that consciousness experience, again, we're talking about experience now, right? Experience right. Had, must play a functional role. And I say, no, not, not necessarily. I, it could have, experience might be a, a byproduct or a, uh, an entailment of being, of, of a creature like ourselves that uh, has these capacities, but it, it itself, may not play a uh, direct functional role in, in um, guiding behavior, which of course is kind of out of our people, cognitive abilities. It kind of, it kind of came out of our, our natural growth and cognitive abilities. It may not have its own fitness function. That's right. That's right. And um, this of course is, is puzzling to people because consciousness is central to our, to our lives. Right. So we, we, commonsensically yeah. think that when we, if we didn't feel pain the way we felt it, we wouldn't avoid uh, damaging our bodies as efficiently. 
I want to say, well, maybe, maybe not, because if you look at the neural, all the neural pathways that are involved in pulling your hand off of a hot stove, you're not going to see consciousness there. And it's from a third person scientific perspective to explain why your hand withdraws quickly. Uh, and even in the learning process, you don't need to invoke the uh, phenomenal experience. You don't need to invoke the private qualitative feel of pain. It can all be accounted for on a neural, um, on a neural basis. So that suggests that maybe we don't need to invoke consciousness per se in a third person scientific story of why we do what we do. Of course, we talk about consciousness and it's essential to our subjective lives. But the way I see it, there are two parallel explanatory stories. One is the phenomenal consciousness story about why I eat chocolate because it tastes really good, right? I love the taste of chocolate, so I have it. But mm -hmm. from a neuroscientist looking in my brain and behavior would not see my taste of chocolate. All she would see <laughs> are the various um, neural pathways doing their thing, uh, neural spike trains lighting up and, 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 and uh, all up and down my uh, uh, gustatory pathway up to, up to the central uh, thalamus or whatever, whatever is involved in the taste. But the taste would not be there. We don't have to invoke uh, phenomenal experience, uh, sensory experience as subjectively felt to account for behavior. So, but yet, as, subject, as conscious creatures, we routinely do that. So the way I, I like to think of it is that there are two two parallel explanatory stories in play. Um, so uh, you've got the, the neural story and you've got the phenomenal story, the experiential story. So, but it's still, the, the question remains is, well, what, what, why is experience there? That's the hard problem as, as David Chalmers has, has uh, named it. And, and do you have a, a theory or a, you know, an idea of what you, why you think that it's there? Why do you think yeah, I, I do. I, I, I do. I, I, I don't want to claim too much because this is still, yeah. my, my take on this is, is very preliminary and it, 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 it borrows a lot from the work of uh, a philosopher named Thomas Metzinger, who's written a couple of really mm -hmm. amazing books on consciousness. One is called The Ego Tunnel. I highly recommend that to our listeners if, if they've not encountered it. It's not that technical, but it gets into the issues very, very nicely. So Metzinger, and he, Metzinger has a book called um, Being No One, The Self-Model Theory of Subjectivity, which is very technical, very long, written in 2003, that I would recommend anyone who really wants to delve deeply into an empirically informed theory, I think a very promising theory of consciousness, and it has to do essentially with representation. And so that's where I'm coming from. I, I think a, a, a representational uh, approach to consciousness shows a lot of promise and that we can think of conscious experience as a type of what I call, and the philosophers call representational content. In other words, a creature like, like us or, or less complex creatures has to represent the world and deal with uh, the world on a very quick basis. In order to do that, you have to have an internal, neurally instantiated a uh, world responsive model of the world that can quickly guide behavior. And a lot of work is being done on rep this representational angle of, uh, of consciousness. And so the reason we might be conscious, I, I'm suggesting, you know, again, borrowing from Thomas Metzinger, is that the processing that, that, that we embody in our brains involves representational content, that is, Neurons, when they're, when they're world responsive and, and constructing models, are, are doing something that is, in a sense, creating a model of the world. And that model has content that is about the world. So, for instance, a face recognition program, this is a, uh, an artificial intelligence program, right? It, it recognizes faces in social media. And so, obviously, when that program is running, it has content that is represent, uh, representations that have to do with faces that it's extracting from your Facebook feed or whatever. Now, That's looking great. at that program, running its algorithms, you're not gonna see anything that looks like a face. All you're gonna see is um, uh, computer oh. algorithms doing their thing using logic gates. 
you'll see electrical impulses, but you're not going to see anything that looks like a face. Yet, that program running up and running has as its content faces. So similarly, when we're running our neural programs, having representing the world, part of that, some of those programs, some of those, those computations or neural processing, depending how you want to talk about it, has representational content. My hypothesis is that some of that content is, in fact, what phenomenal experience or, uh, is. So the, it's not, it's, we can't see content in the system. This explains the privacy of experience. We can't see your pain when you're in pain, but yet it's a real representational content of the state of your body when you're in that, in that state. So that's, it's, this is, may not be making all that much sense to you or the listeners, but uh, it, I try to lay it out in this paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, Locating Consciousness, Why Experience Can't Be Objectified. So that's online at, at naturalism.org if people want to check it out. Uh, yeah, I'll put a link to that. So, oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, my, my hypothesis is, as to why we're conscious is that we're, in representing the world, we end up with representational content that is qualitative because, and this, this is, has yet to be fleshed out and, and is I, just a preliminary thought, and, I, and Metzinger actually gets into this very eloquently in his books. It's that to, when we represent the world, we have to have certain, a certain kind of content that is not further representable. Because if you kept on representing your representations, you'd end up in an, an epistemic regress. You'd, so in other words, representations have to bottom out somewhere. You, there have to be representational primitives that we deploy in modeling the world. And those primitives, because we can't further represent them, it, therefore become qualitative to be a quality and experience is just is not to be able to say anything further about what the quality is and that's exactly what what qualities of experience or qualia as philosophers call them actually are when you look at at, at basic red you'll see that it's it's definitely red but you can't say anything or discriminate anything further about it that's what it is to be the quality red okay now why should we have such a thing well, we need these primitive sorts of representations in order not to, to block the epistemic regress, to, to make sure that we don't go down the, uh, the rabbit hole of having representations about representations about representations. We, it has to bottom out somewhere. So that's probably in a sort of an obscure nutshell, the kind of explanation of being conscious in the sensory qualitative sense that um, that I would propose. It also explains why content is, is private. It only exists for the system that's running the, this informational representational um, uh, process. So, yeah. uh, but again, <laughs> this is, this is uh, not a full, fully developed theory by any, by any stretch, but I think it's got, I think it's got legs. I think, and, and people are working along these lines uh, in predictive processing, Carl Friston, Andy Clark uh, are working on something called predictive processing and predictive coding, and they they actually have a, a paper in the Journal of Consciousness Studies, uh, the, uh, the a recent issue uh, about this this very idea that that some processes would uh, support or end up uh, supporting the uh, the qualitative nature of certain sorts of representation, but I, I I'm going on and on here, so you should you should interrupt me. <laughs> well, I, I have it's an interesting theory because I think you know one thing I've been looking at, and, I, and I'm not qualified to have a theory. I just ask smart people like you. But when I'm <laughs> when I see this, I feel like our brains have these models, these schema, like you're maybe referring mm -hmm. to, if if I'm getting it right, and so when I see an apple, when I'm a, when I'm a infant or a toddler and I see an apple, my reaction to that red apple is very limited. But then over my life, I have taken a bite of the apple and I understand the, the sweetness and the crunch and the difference between the skin and the flesh. And maybe I bit into a worm or a big bruise. You know, I have all these different things that my brain has refined its model of this apple. And so 
when I see the apple, my personal experience, which you cannot observe, has its own qualia because I see the apple and my brain fires up this schema model. Mm-hmm. And now I'm having sensations and the, these qualia are based on all the different sensations I've built over my lifetime and also do not include anything I've never experienced. Right. So I mean, yeah, like, certainly there's, uh, yeah. No, so uh, I don't know if that's where you're going or if that's close to what you're thinking. Well, certainly there's a moment to moment, very close correspondence between what your brain is doing now and your, and your phenomenal experience. And, and uh, of course, learning has played a role in the, in the, in what your experience is like. Um, and so we've, but I think in terms of sensory experience, what you had as a kid is not that different from what you're experiencing now. You may have your higher level uh, uh, descriptions of, of say the apple might be more sophisticated. Um, you've, you've learned a lot about it, but your sensory experience is not, not much different now than when you were a young, young child. Uh, but you have a cognitive overlay that has organized it conceptually, um, of course. But take dreams, for instance. In a dream, you're not in contact with the world. You're not seeing any physical objects. Your uh, your brain is right. is pretty much isolated in a, from any sensory input. And yet you're having a full-blown conscious experience. I don't know if you've ever had lucid dreams in which you realize that no, you're but I have, quite a... I have experienced altered states of consciousness. Okay. All right. But sticking with dreaming though, dreaming is, I think a really important way to get into the problem of consciousness because it shows that sensory experience can be vivid, just as vivid as in waking life. And you can even know you're having experience while you're dreaming when you're completely cut off from the world. So this this shows to me as a matter of empirical fact that conscious experience supervenes that it depends on what the brain is doing from moment to moment. And the quality of your experience, the quality of your experience, uh, say of redness or of of a smell or a taste, all of which you can have in dreams uh, are, are, are just are functions of what the brain is doing at that very moment. So this cements, this um, supports to me very strongly the, the, the neural hypothesis about consciousness, that it isn't, um, uh, that it, you don't need to be in, in direct contact with the, the external world to be conscious. It's, it's really a matter of what the brain is doing. Now, yeah. some people, as you know, take the, have the idea that the the inactivists or the embodied consciousness folks think that consciousness is requires or uh, some kind of active engagement with the world. I, I don't think that's the case. I, I think it's it really is a matter of of um, neural activity. But again, the problem is well, why should it arise? And there that we have different theories of why. If you take a a neural uh, a brain based view of consciousness, then the question is, and there's a lot of debate about it. What what is it that's going going on in the brain that would uh, entail the existence of consciousness for, for, for instance, someone who's dreaming? And uh, some interesting work is being done about the, the minimal conscious experience, the MPE, as Thomas Metzinger puts it, minimal phenomenal experience. Uh, and they've looked, I just saw a paper yesterday where they, they did MRI scans and EEG readings from a very experienced meditator, and speaking of altered states, and this meditator was able to get into a very deep meditative state while he was in the scanner, which of course is difficult because they're, they're loud and yeah. noisy machines, but okay. he was able to do it. And they were able to pinpoint uh, for this single individual the neural, uh, neural pathways that were associated with this very deep uh, experience, this, this altered state of, of selflessness, of no sensory experience, of just of bare awareness. So that to me is, is re- very important research because it, it allows us yeah. to pinpoint what might be the, the minimal uh, neural correlate of consciousness. And that, and so to see, you know, what is that, what are, are those correlates, what are they doing, uh, what are their functions? And then we can get a, a much better handle on what, what a, uh, consciousness, how it, how it arises. Yeah. 
Yeah, good point. And that's a that's a good uh, segue into maybe a, a detour here, um, because I did I was fortunate enough to have a conversation with Christoph Koch, and he talks about obviously panpsychism, which along with illusionism seems to be kind of two of the buzzwords going around the philosophy mm. right now. But yeah, but he and Tononi are developing this thing to to measure uh, consciousness, and, and he says everything down even to a stone. You know, so the the idea of mm. being able to really drill down into to, to measure consciousness and not only the neural pathways, but into inanimate objects or, you know, to literally be able to understand something that's like to be a bat. What what do you what's your take? I know you mentioned both panpsychism and illusionism, but what's your your take on, on panpsychism? Well, Tononi's view, IIT informational uh, integrated information um T, uh, I'm theory, blanking yeah. on the last word. Theory. Thank yeah, theory. You. IIT. Uh, right. Which I, I don't know. I, th- I think that it's got a lot going for it, but I don't think it's equivalent to panpsychism because what the theory is saying is that there has to be a certain amount of internal organization of a system in order to have any kind of experience. Of course, taken to its extreme, the, the theory, and it's been criticized for this, would say that something as simple as a photodiode with an on and off switch basically would, would, be, would host phenomenal experience, uh, have something that it's like to be it, have qualium. And I, I don't buy that at all. Uh, but it, it, the theory does not say that a stone uh, or any, or, uh, would have any sort of experience. It doesn't, the IIT is not saying that as panpsychists do, by Galen Strawson or, or, or Philip Goff, uh, those panpsychists say that it, conscious experience resides at the micro level, that it's a fundamental feature of physical reality. Uh, these right. guys are physicalists, but they're, they're putting consciousness as sort of the, the intrinsic nature of the, of the physical is what they're saying consciousness is. I don't, again, I don't, I don't buy that at all. I don't think there's any evidence for panpsychism. I think it's a, a, a real cul-de-sac. Uh, an unfortunate diversion from the real work that's being done in investigating consciousness. But IIT, Tononi's um, program is, is a uh, hypothesis, is very interesting because it, it is representational and informational in the way it uh, supposes consciousness might arise. And it's, of course, it, it has its, its equations, it has its, it's empirically testable to some extent, it's, uh, it might be falsifiable, and, and in fact, a lot of people have gone after it and tried to falsify it by showing that, well, consciousness might be uh, in a photodiode. It, that seems to be a counterexample. Or it might be in a completely right. static system that, that's not operating or doing anything. But I don't think IIT is equivalent to any kind of panpsychist um, hypothesis, even though Christoph Koch might have said that. I, if he has, I think he's mistaken about his own theory. Uh, what what IIT is saying is that a system, if it instantiates integrated information, which of course is a matter of being having sufficient internal organization, if it instantiates integrated in- information, then it might uh, host experience. Now, you, you know, it, it, because that's informational, it, it, I, I give it um, kudos for that. I think I think it, they, they are. Um, on the right track in in that sort of yeah. general area because it is it's saying yeah internal organization for instance of the brain is critical uh, for consciousness and then the question is well what kind of organization what has to be going on uh, for consciousness to exist but uh, just yeah. to get oh, you also mentioned illusion there's illusionism and this is you know uh, uh, as you say, <laughs> one of the uh, buzzwords going around, uh, Dan Dennett, uh, who I've studied with, I was in his consciousness seminar last year, is an illusionist uh, in, in saying that no, qualitative experience really doesn't exist. He, he says experience exists. He, he, he's not a, a eliminativist about consciousness, but he's the sort of physicalist that says there's really nothing qualitative nothing phenomenal about experience. And um, Keith Frankish is his ally <laughs> in illusionism. Yes. And, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I, and the, Frankish is, I interviewed him yeah. a few episodes ago. Yeah. And he's saying, no, there's nothing qualitative about experience. 
It only seems to be qualitative. And I want to say, really? Okay. So you're saying that <laughs> when, when you see red, I want to ask them, can you discriminate a further quality, uh, uh, anything further about red? Their answer would have to be no. And I want to say, well, that's what it is to be qualitative. It's not to be able to discriminate a further element of what it is you're experiencing. So yeah. on the face of it, it's really, I think, it's really hard to deny the existence of qualities and experience. And that's what qualia refers to. But Dennett has saddled qualia with a dualistic um, kind of spooky inter uh, sense, which I think is too bad. The original definition of, qual of, of a quale, or that's a singular term, is simply the qualities that we find in experience. And the, and the question is, how do we explain them? But the illusionists want to deny they exist. They want, Dennett has denied phenomenology consistently throughout his career as a, uh, someone interested in explaining consciousness. That to me right. is, is I, I don't want to say absurd on the face of it, but it's extremely hard for me and, and many others to buy to say that consciousness in this sense isn't real. It is real. I mean, right. uh, looking at your own experience, if you if you have if you're in severe pain and it and if you agree it's qualitative then it's it's as real as any physical object that you encounter. So I want to say that representations, content of representations, are just as real as the world we represent. Yeah. So the, the, that's the, that's the the major thesis of of the paper that I that's that you might link to that representations are as real as the world that they represent because without them, we wouldn't know the world. So this is, and, and this, I, you know, this yeah. representational approach, this representational relation we have to reality, I think is the way, is one promising way in to the problem of consciousness. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but um, the, illusionists, yeah, the illusionists want to deny what we're trying to explain. They want to eliminate it. So, and, and say they're only seemings, you know, okay, but, <laughs> uh, you know, seem, the seemings itself, uh, and Galen Strassen just said this in other seem, seemings themselves are, are, the, are the appearances we're trying to explain. Right. Yeah, I, I had a hard time with it, too. I mean, talking to Keith Frankish, it was, it was very interesting, and obviously it, it's, it's, uh, it's a good way to solve the hard problem by just eliminating it. But there were right. there were some things that that were that were difficult. Um, oh, well, good. I'm glad you felt that way because it, uh, as, as Frankish himself has put it, once you've gotten rid of the hard problem of consciousness, you've got the hard problem of the illusion of consciousness. It seems to me that's simply the same problem. <laughs> right. You've got the illusion of qualities, but yeah, the the illusion of qualities is itself qualitative. But I'm starting to get right. Uh, you know, I'm getting on my high horse here, so I'll stop. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, get a little, little philosophical. What, I got a, <laughs> one last one last big topic before we do a couple wrap up questions is uh, death. So ah. what you know, and, and this is, uh, and I don't know if you if you know my story, but this kind of one of the reasons I started this podcast a couple of years ago was to. Um, I'm also a very um, I don't know scientific physicalist type of thinker. And I, I change my mind every time I talk to one of you guys and hear what you have to say. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't consider that. And so, but I came into this trying to figure out what is consciousness? Does it survive after physical death? And so I know you, you've got uh, some great information out there on this. So what, what's, your, what's your thought on the finality of death and consciousness? Well, Given our conversation thus far, it will come as no surprise to our listeners that I think that when uh, we die and, and dissolve uh, into our component parts, that our our consciousness equally ends. Right? There's no mm -hmm. uh, consciousness does not survive the brain death. Put it that way. Right. But uh, I a while back actually almost two decades ago, I wrote a, a cover story for the Humanist magazine that has since been reprinted in some anthologies, uh, uh, philosophy anthologies. It's on, the, uh, on adnaturalism.org. It's called Death, Nothingness, and Subjectivity. And I'm actually pleased to say that Derek Parfit um, 
uh, Flosser actually looked at it at one point, gave me some good feedback on the paper. So, and in that paper, I used a thought experiment that Derek Parfit, who is now deceased, uh, used to good effect about imagining uh, how you might survive death. Uh, but it wouldn't be you. It would be uh, the thought experiment I use in the papers it goes as follows. And it's meant to show that it, we shouldn't experience, uh, anticipate experiencing nothingness at death. I think most people, when they, uh, when they think about death, think of being trapped in uh, forever in, in a kind of oblivion or nothingness. I, uh, so the question is, well, what should we anticipate at death? Obviously, our personal experience is going to be extinguished because we're you know, our brain is dead. But should we uh, anticipate the onset of nothingness? And my answer is no. And I use a thought experiment uh, about uh, in the paper to to try to illustrate that what we shouldn't anticipate at death is not the end of experience, even though our experience ends. And this is going to sound a little mystical, but I, uh, I, I claim that it's perfectly naturalistic. What we should anticipate is the, the continuation of experience, but just in a, a different personal context. In other words, if you're not if it's not right to anticipate nothingness at death, then what one should anticipate is not a black void, but the continuation of the experience, but just not in the context of being you. Rather, in the con- you should anticipate the, the continuation of experience in the context of being other creatures. So there's no void or emptiness to look forward to, but it is the end of you as a particular locus of consciousness. And uh, I don't know that we have time to get into the thought experiment, but it involves undergoing surgery, waking up as being a transformed person so that basically you've died during surgery and then and a different person right. wakes up, but there's been no void or nothingness between your last experience and the person who wakes up. Because if you've ever undergone anesthesia, you'll know that after you're being put under, put under, you wake up in the recovery room and there's been an instantaneous transition from your last experience before the surgery and your first experience waking up in recovery. Right. Now, what if you woke up in that recovery room with all your memories changed? So in effect, you would have, the person who went into surgery had died and a new person is present in the recovery room. There wouldn't be any nothingness yeah. for the person who had died it would be succeeded by the first experience of the, of the new person. And I want to say that's the kind of thing that we should anticipate at death. But it's a very, it, it, this is, it sounds crazy, I know. You have to read the paper and, and sort of walk through the thought experiment. Uh, but I really, you know, I, I, I managed to convince some people, and if you have the intu- intuition of nothingness, this is a good antidote to that, I think. Yeah. So, so I don't know yeah, if that addresses so I, your I, concerns. I enjoyed that. No, uh, I don't know if it does, but um, it, it's a new concept of, of death that I hadn't read before, and, and I and I enjoy that. So I, I'll link to that also, and just challenge the listeners yeah. to go read that yeah. and go through the thought experiment. I mean, uh, and in the paper, I, I point out uh, that many people have this intuition of impending nothingness. I mean, it really is is quite common. Uh, so it's not that I'm arguing against a straw man. The problem, though, is a lot. Some people might object to this theory because it means that no, we experience can't be extinguished ultimately, and that could be that could be problematic because maybe the Buddhists want it not to be reborn. <laughs> you know, they they want life to be effectively over so we don't have to suffer anymore. But on this view uh, about consciousness and death and subjectivity, there's no such luck. We are always within experience. The subject never right. finds him or herself absent from the scene. And that can be a, b- a bit disconcerting because, you know, on gravestones, they put rest in peace. No, mm-hmm. there's no peace. There's no end to experience. Yeah. It's just, it's always finding itself present in the world as a function of whatever creatures exist. And it can be very yeah. difficult situation to be alive and conscious sometimes, as we yeah. all know. So, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know if you should thank me. It, it could be uh, a, a burden to not to have cessation. As I said, Buddhists always want cessation. There is no, as my view yeah. is no. There is no, there is no cessation for consciousness, believe it or not. And different groups, <laughs> different groups want and believe different things, and that is 
this yeah. is going to challenge a lot of them. Yeah. But again, I, I want to re- reiterate that I'm a naturalist, a scientific based naturalist. I don't put any, any, um, stock in anything supernatural or wooish as the, the current term is. So although what I've just said sounds rather implausible, I think it does have a naturalistic basis. If you look at, at what consciousness is, uh, and, uh, as, as we've been discussing, uh, so anyway, uh, there you have it. Yeah, for it's, it's, it's good to, yeah, it's good to explore that. So, uh, as we wrap up here, what, is there anything else I have not asked you that you want to put out there for the listeners? No, I, I think we've, we've covered it pretty well. We've talked about the reality of conscious experience. It's not an illusion. We've talked about, uh, at least hand, in a hand wavy sense as to what kind of, what I think, what kind of theory, what kind of hypothesis might explain the fact that we, we do have conscious experience. We talked about the fact that consciousness may not play a functional role, even though it's real, that it's private, that it's qualitative, and that a good theory of consciousness has to explain these two fundamental aspects of, being, of, of our being conscious. Um, yeah. I would recommend to people's attention the work of the predictive coding people, predictive processing. Carl Friston, Andy Clark, and others are doing really interesting work. Uh, and of course, uh, Thomas Metzinger is my favorite philosopher of mind. And so definitely check out his, his work because I think he's, he's, okay. he's doing work on meditation, on, on dreaming. Um, so it's, it's fascinating stuff. Consciousness to me is still the most uh, fascinating, uh, albeit perhaps intractable, intractable, intractable problem. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult. So it right. uh, en- engages it is. a lot of good minds, and there are many good minds out there working on it. Oh, uh, I have to say Sam Harris's meditation app is interesting. He gets into the subjective nature of consciousness. So um, recommend that to people's attention. I don't agree with them all, all the way through, but uh, it's a very, again, naturalistic approach to meditation. So those, okay. so those are some of the things. Awesome. And what about you? What, what, uh, when it comes, you have so much on your plate with everything that you look at, but when it comes to consciousness, what, is there something uh, new or different areas or expanding on what you've already been doing? What's, what should we expect coming from you and your, I, uh, your thoughts and experiments? Yeah, um, I think I, I'm going to keep s- staying tuned to the to the work on the notion of content, representational content, because in, in neuroscience, and I asked Dennett about this in the seminar, and he said, you know, there's really no exact consensus about the nature of representation, representational content. It's very complicated, uh, but that's you know, I'll be paying attention to the research, you know, in predictive processing, as I said before. Uh, and uh, other people doing IIT, as these theories get developed and the notion of content represent, I think representation is, is the way to go. So looking at, at research and that is what I'm gonna be paying attention to and seeing how these theories develop. I, I don't think there's any hope with panpsychism. <laughs> so I just have to, <laughs> to reiterate that. Yeah. But, but you know, Philip Goff, you know, a, a very nice fellow, Galen Strawson, very, you know, very good philosopher. I think they're, you know, barking up the very wrong tree, but that's okay. You know, it's, it's all good that they say, yeah. <laughs> but some of it is better than others. Yeah, just got to take a stab at it. So not, not, uh, not high hopes for panpsychism, but is there any breakthrough you see that could uh, kind of, you know, like the internet does for technology, is there anything you see coming that could really kind of advance our understanding of, of consciousness? Well, I think, as I mentioned quite early in, the, in our conversation, this, this research on the minimal uh, correlates of consciousness. Yeah. Getting a fix on, and, and you know, this research is ongoing. It's, it's great. A lot of people are doing it. Uh, Anil Seth uh, is doing fantastic work. Uh, you, may have, you might want to talk to him. He's great. Anil Seth, S-E-T-H, uh, uh, in the U.K. Fantastic work. Yeah, so all this, I'm trying to get this, him. Yeah, oh, do it. He's a wonderful, wonderful researcher, and he, he talks about We're waiting for his next book to come out. Yeah, yeah, oh, me too, <laughs> me too. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, that's what I'm looking forward to is, is uh, the breakthrough, if there will be one, is just on further refining the, the neural and functional correlates of conscious experience. That's, that's what I think is going to shed light. And my, you know, my, my guess is it's going to have to do with representation. 
I may be wrong. Uh, I may be completely off base, but I, but a, a lot of people don't think representation is real. Yeah. <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, it's we're we're in this very interesting time of grappling with this. What to me is the most interesting question facing uh, naturalists, uh, scientific naturalists like myself. And physicalism, you know, is the reigning paradigm. But physicalism as opposed to, say, representationalism, may not be uh, the way it gets solved. We shall see. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, Tom, I am so grateful for your time today. This is a fascinating conversation. I can't, I can't thank you enough, and I appreciate you coming on here to the podcast and sharing your ideas. Well, I kind of talked your ear off. Sorry if I rattled on a bit, but um, no, not it's at exciting all. stuff. <laughs> and thanks for giving me yeah. the, the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this with you. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, mine too. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast at our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.